Britain has just signed a £52 million joint contract with Germany to acquire the RCH-155, a wheeled boxer-mounted artillery system that promises something modern land warfare has been screaming for, the ability to fire and survive in the same breath. On paper, the headline feature is almost cinematic. This gun can engage targets while moving at speeds up to 100 km per hour, reaching out to roughly 70 km. But the deeper story is not about a single platform. It is about how Ukraine has retaught Europe an old lesson with brutal clarity. Artillery is still the backbone of land combat, and the side that lingers after firing is the side that gets erased. So what exactly did London buy? Not a fleet, not a full replacement. Britain will receive an early capability demonstrator, while Germany gets two systems for shared testing and evaluation. That wording matters. A demonstrator is a political statement wrapped in a technical trial, a way to say, we are moving without committing to the expensive, long-term reality of mass procurement. And that creates the first key question, is this a genuine acceleration of British artillery modernization or a carefully staged step designed to buy time while the real decisions are still unresolved? To understand why the RCH-155 is suddenly attractive, you have to zoom out to the British Army's mobile fires platform program, the effort to find a long-term successor to existing artillery capability. Britain's Archer systems were procured as an interim solution after the UK transferred AS-90 self-propelled guns to Ukraine. That transfer was strategically meaningful, but it left a gap at home, and interim solutions have a habit of becoming semi-permanent when budgets tighten and priorities shift. The RCH-155 demonstrator is, in effect, a bridge to a bridge, an attempt to keep momentum while the mobile fires platform competition and requirements continue to solidify. Now, why the RCH-155 specifically? The answer is survivability through tempo. Traditional self-propelled guns already learn shoot and scoot, but Ukraine has turned that concept into a life-or-death drill measured in minutes and seconds. Counter-battery radars, drones that never blink, and loitering munitions that punish predictability have compressed the timeline between firing and being targeted. If you can fire without stopping, if you can displace while still executing your mission, you are not merely faster. You are harder to find, harder to fix, and harder to kill. And on today's battlefield, that is the real performance metric. The RCH-155 is mounted on the Boxer armored vehicle, which immediately signals a preference for wheeled mobility, strategic deployability, and logistics commonality. The British Army already operates Boxer, which means the platform is not arriving as a complete stranger. In theory, that reduces friction in maintenance, spares, and training pipelines. But it also raises a second question. How much of this purchase is driven by pure battlefield capability and how much is driven by the practical need to standardize fleets, reduce unique supply chains, and convince finance ministries that modernization will not become an endless bespoke project? Then there is the crew concept. The RCH-155 can operate with a two-person crew thanks to automated loading and fire control, and it is advertised as delivering up to eight rounds per minute. Automation is not just a convenience, it changes how you generate firepower. Smaller crews mean lower manpower demands, potentially faster training throughput, and fewer soldiers exposed during the firing cycle. But automation also creates new dependencies. When a system is heavily automated, the question is not only how fast can it fire, but how well does it cope with shock, dust, battle damage, electronic warfare, and degraded navigation? In peacetime trials, automation is a force multiplier. Under sustained combat stress, it becomes a reliability test. And in an environment like Ukraine, where GPS disruption, electronic attack, and improvised adaptations are routine, resilience matters as much as rate of fire. This is where the British government's messaging becomes revealing. Defense readiness and industry minister Luke Pollard framed the purchase explicitly through the lens of Ukraine. Fire on the move, hit at 70 kilometers, move fast away from returning fire, then fire again. That is a direct translation of Ukrainian battlefield logic into procurement language. But rhetoric does not solve the hardest part of artillery modernization, which is not the gun. It is the system around the gun. Sensors, targeting, communications, ammunition supply, repair capacity, and the doctrine that turns hardware into sustained combat power. A platform that can relocate quickly still needs a kill chain that can keep up. Otherwise, you end up with a very advanced vehicle waiting for coordinates it cannot receive fast enough, or firing missions it cannot exploit. And that brings us to the joint nature of the deal. This purchase sits under the 2024 Trinity House Agreement, a UK-German framework covering procurement, industrial policy, and interoperability. On its face, it is a sensible European response to the reality that defense industrial capacity is finite. Shared testing and evaluation can reduce duplication, accelerate certification, and align standards across NATO partners. 
The political subtext is equally important. Europe is trying to prove it can act as an industrial and operational bloc, not just a collection of national armies shopping separately. But joint procurement also has its own friction. When two countries align on a demonstrator, they align on questions as well. What ammunition standardization will be prioritized? How will software and fire control interfaces be harmonized with national command systems? Who owns the intellectual property for modifications? What happens when operational requirements diverge when one side wants maximum automation and the other prioritizes maintainability under field conditions? The Trinity House framework can smooth these disagreements, but it cannot eliminate them. It simply moves the argument into structured channels. There is also a strategic signaling dimension. The Ministry of Defense is positioning this contract as evidence of a broader defense as an engine for growth premise and as proof of UK-German alignment within NATO's deterrence posture. That is a neat narrative. Buy modern artillery, strengthen industry, integrate with allies and deter adversaries. Yet the purchase, as announced, is still an early-stage capability demonstrator rather than a confirmed production order. Numbers and timelines for a full rollout remain undefined. And in defense planning, undefined numbers are not a detail, they are the whole story. So what should we take from this? First, the British Army is acknowledging that mobility is no longer optional. If your artillery cannot survive the counter-battery and drone ecosystem, it becomes an expensive liability. Second, Britain is betting that leveraging boxer commonality and German partnership can compress acquisition timelines and reduce cost risk. Third, London is trying to keep the Mobile Fires platform program moving with tangible hardware rather than letting it drift into years of requirements debates. But the uncomfortable question remains, will Britain commit to scale? A demonstrator can validate performance, integrate into doctrine, and generate political momentum. It can also become a substitute for real procurement if budgets tighten or strategic attention shifts. If the UK wants credible land-based deterrence, it will need more than a cutting-edge concept. It will need enough systems, enough ammunition, and enough trained crews and maintainers to sustain operations under pressure. In other words, capability is not what one platform can do on a test range. Capability is what a force can do on day 30 of a high-intensity campaign. The RCH-155, with its ability to fire on the move and rapidly reposition, is a direct answer to the deadliest trend in modern artillery warfare, the shrinking window between firing and being targeted. The contract is also a political artifact tying Britain closer to Germany and showcasing NATO-aligned modernization. Yet until London puts firm numbers on the table, until the demonstrator becomes a program of record with production, logistics and doctrine behind it, this remains a promising opening move, not the end game. And that is the real takeaway. Britain is not just buying a gun, it is testing whether it can rebuild artillery credibility in an era where every shot leaves a digital trail, every pause invites a drone and every delay can be fatal. The RCH-155 might be the right machine for that reality. The only question is whether the UK will match the machine with the scale and urgency the battlefield now demands.